I have to ask you for a favor to start this interview. Could you please pronounce your, the title of the, your last film, the one we show? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I can. Um, it's, it's onomatopoeic. I think it's a, it's a, it's a quote by D.H. Uh, Lawrence. Yes. Um, I think it's when he was very angry, um, he, he just wrote that instead of words. So they're just sort of sounds. Um, I've never tried to, no one's ever tried, got me to pronounce it. So um, it's, it's a tricky one. Why did you choose it as a title for your film? Because you were f furious about something too? Um, I guess it was, um, it just reminded me of all the, the sounds that the kind of oil spill respondent um, was encountering with the kind of black gooey masses um, and yes, a, an anger um, or frustration of, of having um, to kind of deal with these, um, these calamities, although he's a very cheerful man. Um, the oil spill responder that this work is based on. You uh, found for this film somebody who has filmed for at least 30 years, I think, his professional life and the whole problem of pollution w through oil. Um, what is the fictitious part in it? Because he's telling his stories, you use his camera shots, but As all your works, there's also uh, always a mixture uh, around fiction, narration, um, and uh, the facts, and then the models you use from your studio. So we, we, we talk about that later. First, what is the fiction part of it in this story? Um, well, he, so I got invited by uh, Polyeco's Contemporary Art Initiative to do something um, around the idea of tox toxic waste. They're a toxic waste cleaning company from Greece. And because I'm interested in kind of oral histories and storytelling, um, I asked them to put me in touch with one of, uh, you know, an employee who could tell a story. And Mr. Theodosius is one of their oldest employees. And he he's full of kind of anecdotes, um, And the fictional in that is that I also talk to other uh, employees in the company um, and kind of combined a lot of different information also from more scientific research, uh, combined that into one kind of perspective. So um, it is from, a, from an oil spill responder's perspective, but not everything in the, in the narration is Uh, literally set by Mr. Theodosius. There are some some points. Um, so we we did a lot of we did a few interviews, and then um, what was astonishing and nobody in the company knew was that he had filmed all of these callouts. Um, and yeah, I mean it was kind of in the early 80s when you know not everybody had a phone and was standing there all day with filming themselves. He, he was just interested. He didn't really quite know why he was filming it, I think, to show his children later. But it was just... And he also didn't know whether he wanted to initially cooperate um, with the film in, in the way that he did in the end, with the, um, you know, get, getting me uh, to edit the archive. Every situation was different. We improvised. Swimming through petrol, naked to reach the far side of a wreck. Then, diving back into the sea, our bodies covered in dispersant. Oil should be magnetically charged so we can round up these flimsy membranes into an accountable body. You said that, that even in the company that they didn't know that he had filmed. So was he 
kind of relieved that he found you and suddenly he could use these films? Um, Or was it a hard job to, to persuade him to give them to you? Yeah, kind of a bit of both. He didn't quite know what to make of it. It took about a year. I went to Santorini where he's been working on the Sea Diamonds, which is a sunken cruise ship, um, which is still at the bottom of the sea there. Um, and he'd been there for 10 years and we went and did some sonar filming and he doesn't speak English and I don't speak Greek. So we are, are you know, he, he eventually gave me this hard drive and said, here is my life. Uh, and it was like all the Christmases and Easter's and children's birthday parties. And on top of that were all these call outs. I and mean, we kind of left that in the film also to give that idea of being on standby because it's um these kind of accidents happen usually around Christmas and Easter and um yeah I guess I was trying to give um toxic waste and pollution a kind of human angle um he he is very as I said before he's very cheerful and he's like talking about being tied to a mast while a helicopter is coming to rescue him and you know there's a lot of stories that are really kind of heroic and um, I yeah, I was very fascinated by that kind of approach to uh, something quite gruesome, I suppose. We, we mentioned before that that you always, in all your filmic works, you mix uh, 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 documentary images or, uh, in this case, uh, um, the, the, the films he had done with uh, models Uh, you construct in the studio and then you uh, film. Can you explain a little bit why you do so? Is it to have illustrations of it, what is said, or is it complementary? And how does it get together? Because it has something very, it's crafted, it's not digital. So it's, it's something, there's a point which seems very important for me. It's like uh, uh, moving image sculptures. Hmm. Yes, so they're, they're analog. I mean, I've only done kind of um, that in the last two two works, but with this one, um, the ship that he'd been working, which is a kind of the central, the, the cruise ship, the central character kind of in this film, um, kind of it sounded like, um, and it's totally unfilmable, it's 150 meters down at the sea, uh, below sea level, It sounded like a, a bigger version of what I usually do. So I make these model maquettes and I dip them in oil paint and then into a tank. So they kind of drip. And the ship in Santorini was kind of doing that with these kind of uh, interiors that are covered in the ship's um, uh, engine oil. Um, so in this film, that kind of really fitted also because you couldn't get there. I mean, divers were trying to uh, get into the ship. It didn't, it doesn't work. It's very difficult. It's very inaccessible. So I guess they're kind of reconstructions of these kind of uninhabitable spaces. So you see, this is a two screen work on the left is his archive. Then on the right uh, are the models in the ship. Um, also slight, um, other um, situations like ferromagnetic sort of um, molecular structures and but mostly interiors that are kind of dripping and then there's the sonar uh, footage which is uh, something I filmed there with a fish finder together with him um, which is this kind of to, for me it looks like a kind of old photograph um, these kind of very abstract sort of um, representations of a structure you can see the ship only just with these kind of chains coming out but the landscape is very um, moon, almost moonlike in a way I nearly got stuck to Sanopi as a child. We all fainted in our sleep. A brazier smoked in the room. Five in a bed, including mom and dad. Someone found us. We were lucky to escape that god of terror. 
and his shadow sponges of carbon. Mr. Lambros, there isn't a better employer. In the 35 years I was with the company, never had my pay been late. If the accountant made a mistake, they got the job. Since Polycrates found his wedding ring inside the fish, the sea is no longer that ancient place of no return. It spits up oil and all things filled with air. Our first spill was in Pahit, Megara. I needed money to baptize my little one so I went. Can you explain a little bit the, the sonar camera, how it functions, or what, what is it used for normally? It comes from medicine, doesn't it? Uh, yes, no, it's, it's, this is actually a fish finder, so it's quite a sort of domestic um, thing that people find, um, have on a boat to look at fish. Um, but it shows up really beautifully, all the structures in the sea. Um, and it works on sound waves, which are then uh, echoed back and then translated into an image. So you're really kind of looking at sound, which is a very interesting thing. Um, and yes, it's used um, in, in medicine and to a lesser extent in or more recently to for marine archaeology and uh, also looking at pollution. But it has been developed by much further by medicine. Um, yeah. With this uh, topic of oil pollution, you seem to, how should I say, make a, construct a bridge to a work, to an early work, the kilowatt work, where you also treated a, a topic of uh, uh, the environment and environmental uh, changing and damage. Can you? Uh, say something about the kilowatt work yes, from 2000. Uh, hmm? Kilowatt dynasty is a work from 2000 and it's the first time I worked um, in, in water. So um, it's also very much for me still a pre-internet work. So the, um, although the internet existed, it wasn't really you know out there so much as it is now. So in the Hubei province in China, the Three Gorges Dam was being built. And for that, I think two and a half million people had to move. And all their uh, surroundings and villages would be sub and towns would be submerged underwater. So for me, that had a very mythical kind of visual uh, aspect, uh, as well as a social aspect. This teleshopping program will be broadcast from a flashy underwater center at the bottom of the newly formed lake. The country's biggest multinational selling electrical appliances will expect a big shopping craze and finance the program as a marketing tool. People will still be able to watch their old valley while being seduced into buying a washing machine. And no one other than my mother will get the privileged job of presenting it. A divorced mother of one ex-quiz show host, then in her late 30s, will give it her best in a tangy colour two-piece, leaning casually on shiny washing machines in front of various underwater scenes. But in the third month, the slick backdrops will change due to heavy siltation. What happens next depends on who you'll speak to. Another question related to this whole internet and digital era we live in. You, you insist very much on this analog way of using with your sonar camera 
and the models you build in the studio. Uh, so they, to many people who do not know your work so well, that they might look these effects digital, but they are not. Why is it so important to to stay in the analog? Um, well, I really like working with my uh, with materials and um, also the unpredictability of of working with um, materials that move in the water. So I film in tanks and uh, the, the paint and the interaction with, with that. And I think if if I was to work with CGI, I, I'd have to plan more or maybe have, I'm not sure how much accidental, the accidental um, will would come into it. Um, also, I don't really like, I'm, I'm not a, you know, I'm not a nat digital native, so I, I'm not really so keen on spending any time on a computer um, unless uh, necessary. So I think it, it's also like the kind of serendipity of, of going with accident and going with the kind of uh, unpredictable. Um, and yeah, the joy of making these these maquettes and models and and inventing new things, uh, new processes that that kind of animate material. Also, I think there is something with CGI that it still feels quite like gravity doesn't quite sort of work yet. So it's always there is something. Obviously, it's amazing, but there's also something that you don't quite feel the weight of things. I don't know; it's hard to explain, but it's. Yeah, I mean, it's just I, I enjoy what I do um, at the moment. So, in two thousand seventeen, in the third edition of Kino der Kunst, we showed the film you did before about the London house where Vincent van Gogh lived, and you made this house speak. You gave it a voice, so to say. Yeah which was the, the, the main fiction thing, is that there was a house speaking. Yes. Uh, could you tell us some words about uh, this project? Yeah, so there was a, a house that I'd, I'd noticed um, in passing that had a blue plex saying Vincent van Gogh lived here. And in 2012, um, a Chinese bis businessman, Mr. Wang, bought this house on unseen in auction and the house hadn't changed hands in 50 years so it's a very long time for a house in London to to be in the same family and was was actually a kind of ruin um, we then I contacted Art Angel which is a big commissioning body in London and we then uh, collaborated with Mr Wang and found out the kind of different narratives that were playing in the house so there was a a postman in the 1970s, 70s who went through the census and discovered that that was the house that Vincent van Gogh lived in. He lived in several places in South London and in uh, Kent. And he only lived there for a year. But what I I was fascinated by the the kind of added value, um, you know, that, it, that somebody would buy a kind of ruin um, in unseen in auction because of his love love for Van Gogh um, and also I'm, I'm often interested in contradiction in, in my work and the problem with this house was when the the Smiths they were called bought it in the 50s this was a very typical London two up two down and then it became listed and graded which means that you um, that it's a monument so these kind of uh, these, well, I suppose you could call them, all, you know, normal people suddenly lived in a monument, which means that you can't just go on a ladder and fix the roof. You have to have approval, and and because of this kind of status, the house became a ruin because they couldn't preserve it in the way that um, the guidelines uh, indicated. And on that kind of idea of like, you know, what's what what's preservation and what is. Um, what sort of value does a place get um, by by this kind of fleeting um, idea of Van Gogh living there for a year? Three years ago, a postman rang the bell to inform my wife that the world-famous painter Vincent van Gogh had lived at this very house. In 1873, Vincent was 19 and a man of independent means working in a gallery in Covent Garden. 
In a letter to his brother, he mentions his landlady, a Mrs. Lawyer from Clapham. After a hundred year wait, the census of 1871 became public and this postman, Mr. Chalcroft, finally found a Eugenie and an Ursula with the unusual surname of Lawyer registered at this address. In addition, Mr. Chalcroft has located a granddaughter of Eugenie Lawyer, a certain Miss Enid Pewter living in Kent. In a box in this lady's attic, he came upon a drawing of a row of houses on Hackford Road, which he knows to be one of Van Gogh's earliest sketches. You see, it was in this house that Vincent's character was beginning to form into that of an artist. And my house, although of no architectural merit, should be preserved to commemorate this notable former tenant. Keenly anticipating your reply, yours truly, Arthur Brown. November 1974. November 1974. Greater London, 1974. Greater London Dear Council. Mr. Brown, the Dear Mr. Brown, the planning committee is delighted to learn that such a legendary character once found his home in our capital. We've been in contact with the Institute of Expertise in Holland to confirm that your house was Van Gogh's precise address. They have informed me that the word lawyer, crucial in Mr. Chalcroft's findings, means rent, and that it features no less than 22 times in Vincent's French letters. If he was in the idle habit of calling his landlady Mrs. Rent, he could have lived anywhere. The authenticity of the drawing, therefore, will be pivotal in our decision to reconsider demolition. It is presently at the Institute for Examination. Uh, hoping to have informed you sufficiently at this stage, E. Connor. What models did you build? Did you move inside the house? Yeah, no, there was no sonar here. It was just the filming in the house, which was just amazingly dilapidated and um, with a director of photography, with a, you know lots of smoke, and it looked very sort of um, atmospheric. And then there were m models of, um, I suppose, kind of looking at um, Van Gogh's paintings, um, also looking at because uh, Van Gogh arrived in London in a very kind of for him it must have been Blade Runner because the dinosaurs had just been announced because before that time there were no dinosaurs and he is a very religious man coming in a very agnostic kind of futuristic London so kind of aspects of that are in the film um, yeah in in all your films have a certain, a very formal quality. It, it's, there's always, a, also, especially through the images of the models you have in your studio, you build in your studio, there is a, a, a game of, with, with the notion of beauty. So what is beauty for you? Um, yeah, that's an interesting question. I think, um... I try and make the imagery that is kind of unusual, I suppose, and, and that attracts me, you know, and I, um, what is beauty for me? Yeah, that's a very difficult question. I guess it's... Um, but it has to do something with the, the unknown, unknown, because uh, you, you create really new images which we haven't seen before. Yes, so there's that kind of element of reveal. So you work on something which then will reveal itself in front of the camera. Um, so that the, I guess I work with circular tanks sometimes, which kind of act like distorting lenses, mm -hmm. um, water distorted. So it, it's um, kind of this kind of, I suppose, magic that happens. The Express has cried neatly into a boom for nine whole years. Just a few drops a day. We circle the tail eating worm with oil loving pads. 
We play Russian roulette with mascaras, mini bar bottles, tennis balls, vibrators, light bulbs, lipsticks, ready meals, doll's heads, piano keys, coffee too. What floats on the surface becomes a missile 150 meters deep. Empty barrels, they can kill you. If one of those comes up, you stand no chance. But Nikos is never worried about that. He seems more concerned with arguments he starts in the port's only cafe, 